That's our purpose here. That's our purpose. I always wanted to know what was the human purpose here. It was to enrich the world. Yeah. Someone's going to come around one day and they're going to say, whatever it is, what are we doing right now is a form of enriching the world. And the way now, see, now we have this. You know how many millions and hundreds of million people know that he does this now? That's enriching the world. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Hot Box, and I'm Evan Britton. And I'm Mike Tyson. And Mike, we've got a really fascinating guest today, Extremely man. Extremely fascinating, I like that word. Yeah. We've got the man, Justin Wren, in the house. Welcome, my brother. Man, What's thank up, you Jeff? so much. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you so much, Mike. This is uh, pretty surreal for me to be here with you guys. Uh, my guy, Matthew, right here has watched every episode of the podcast, all 53 or so that you guys wow. have released. And I love it. He absolutely loves it. You're, after your first episode, he said, I've got to be on the show. And so I'm so grateful that you guys are Thank having you. me on. Hey, man. He's Thank a great you. hype man to know that you got to get on hot boxing. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, to get the word out there, man. Mm. Well, Justin, I mean, you're a professional MMA fighter, but really, I mean, you're so much more than that. You're an incredible humanitarian Right now, um, the most timely issue that you're really the tip of the spear on is this anti-bullying movement and standing with Raiden, yeah. who's a young man in high school. Actually, he's 12. He's, he's a big boy, though. Yeah, he's, he's a big 12 boy, years old. Um, maybe before we jump into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey to starting Fight for the Forgotten? Sure. And, um, yeah, let's just start there, man. Okay. First, just so grateful for both of you guys having me on. Uh, Thank this you. is awesome. Thank you. Uh, fighting, uh, for me was something I found after getting, uh, relentlessly bullied growing up. I think a lot of martial artists, MMA fighters grew up being bullied, not being the bully. Um, and so found martial arts through being bullied. And so that was my story. Uh, at 13 years old, I'd already gone through five years of being relentlessly bullied, sitting at the lunch table by myself, not being welcome at other tables, um, getting pelted in the back of the head with chocolate milk spit wads or other f pieces of food or, or fist as kids walked by. I remember getting, uh, I don't know, beat up in the locker room. I was in eighth grade, seventh grade, and uh, was in the football locker room, just sitting there, got hit in the back of the head with a football helmet, didn't even see it coming, just got blindsided by it, cheap shot. Uh, had my, my clothes from the, the locker room while I'm in the showers, um, you know, all my clothes thrown out into the, the, the auditorium or the, the gym, the, the volleyball girls, and uh, you know, I'm 12 years old, heavy set kid, and all my clothes are in with the, uh, the girls' volleyball team. And uh, I don't have anything to cover up with. Fuck. And so uh, then other times publicly ridiculed. I'll, I'll give you one story, Mike, real quick. But uh, my middle school crush wanted to catch her attention. Um, oh, biggest crush I'd ever had. <laughs> and so I, uh, I found out she was having a birthday party. I got the invitation to it. And it was a costume contest. The winner was going to get a prize. And so on it said the prize was a Dr. Pepper gumball machine. So Dallas, Fort Worth, Dr. Pepper's a big thing. <laughs> and uh, I, I found out other people were going as Batman, Superman, all these different things um, or, or characters. I probably should have gone as Thor, you know, being a Viking looking guy. Uh, but I found out she loved Transformers and her favorite Transformer was Optimus Prime. Love him. So I decided I would go <laughs> as Dr. Optimus Pepper to her, her birthday party. So her dad worked at Dr. Pepper. She loved Transformers. The, it was a Dr. Pepper. a big Pepper. factory there? Yeah, Dr. down, down there, Dallas-Fort Dallas. Worth. That's where her dad worked. And that's why the prize was a Dr. Pepper gumball machine, because he worked there. So anyways, from head to toe, I lived in a little country town, Crowley, Texas. And uh, my mom, with some duct tape, and me with some cardboard boxes of DP, Dr. Pepper, we made myself into Dr. Optimus Pepper, head to toe. 24-pack <laughs> on the head, 12-packs on the arm, chest plate, I had a shield and a sword. Went to the party. My mom said, man, she's going to love this. Get to her party. Her grandmother, Mimi, opened the door. Mimi goes, oh, my gosh, Jennifer's going to love this. She was surprised, but, like, Jennifer's going to love this. Walk in. The rumors at school were true. I get to just push the button. I uh, didn't have to pay for it, and a Dr. Pepper pops out. They had this in, in, their, in their living room. 
I go to the backyard, open the door, and I'm met by all my peers. And I get hit with a couple flashes of light. Um, and my eyes adjust. I hear the sound of laughter. And I look out, and not one of my classmates are dressed up. Yeah. It was just me. And then I hear my middle school crush crush me saying, I can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. Mm. Next to her, Tyler said, you're worthless. And next to her, Justin, Warren, or Justin a guy, said, um, you should just kill yourself. Really? And so not, it was just a, a big setup. Not one other kid dressed up, just me, just so that they could publicly ridicule me, shame me. And uh, that's when I started the biggest battle of my life, which was against depression um, and suicidal ideation. You know, at 13 years old, just like with Raiden right now, being 12 years old, you believe the things people say about you. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have that resilience built up in you yet. And the effects of bullying can last a lifetime unless you have some big life transformation thing happen, a coach come into your life and mentor you, uh, tell you you can be great, believe in you. Um, and so, yeah, at 13 years old, I started that biggest battle of my life. Probably a few weeks after that, maybe a couple months after that, I found uh, MMA. I was at a, uh, it's called Trader's Village. It was like a flea market uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I found a used VHS tape store. And when I was there, I found MMA. And it was UFC, not one, one was missing. But I think it was like UFC two through nine or two through 11. And I spent all my allowance on that. Because when I found it, I looked at these guys and my first initial thought was these guys don't get bullied. That was my first thought. And then turn it over, I saw boxing versus wrestling versus kickboxing versus jujitsu versus sumo versus all these things. And so I bought it all, uh, went home with it. I had to hide it from my parents. My parents were real conservative. Um, and, uh, but I just, I just fed on it. I, I, loved, I loved that these guys probably don't get bullied, but I fell in love, truly in love with the chess match of it, combining all the different sports, putting it into one. Uh, this is kind of funny. But I don't really share this, but uh, when my dad found the used VHS tapes under my bed, he thought it was a stack of porn, <laughs> but, but it was just MMA. Um, and yeah, so that's that kind of how. Porn MMA bits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but that's that's wow. kind of how it all started. How I found MMA was was through being bullied, and then figuring out these guys don't get bullied. Um, and so that's whenever I started my martial arts journey and found wrestling and fighting and started pursuing it. Wow, dude. But then when you find out, this is interesting, because I understood that, too. When I was hmm. going to Boston, nobody fucks with these guys. But then when you realize in life, these guys, those who everybody's scared of, who are emotionally and psychologically, they're, um, they're very kind, hmm. and they're very loving, hmm. and they want to love everybody, and they're easy to take advantage of psychologically, mentally, financially, and stuff. So they get bullied from a different perspective then. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 Well, and then from there... At, at 15, started wrestling. Uh, I had two Olympic gold medalists as my high school coaches that taught oh. me to visualize. Yeah, Kenny Monday. Yeah, Kenny Monday and Kendall Cross. I don't know if you know Kenny Monday, but he's been my coach for uh, more than 15 years now, since I was 15 to 32. Yeah. Wow, man. Uh, first uh, African American to win the, the wrestling uh, Olympic gold medalist or be an Olympic gold medalist. And Incredible. He, he's been such a, a guiding light in my life, um, a coach, a mentor. And he's, he's like that for so many guys. Now he coaches MMA. Um, and he taught me to believe in myself because when I first stepped on the wrestling mats, I was completely timid because I had been bullied for since yeah. I was at least eight and I'm 15. So I would, I would, I would telegraph everything I was going to do. I would show uh, what I was going to do before I did it. So the guys would know how to defend it because they've wrestled their whole life. Or even if they had a year on me, they knew what I was going to do before I did it. And then those guys just started teaching not just muscle memory, but but um, but really confidence, having confidence in my moves. Um, and then finally it just kind of clicked one day and I became a state champion, then All-American, then national champion. And then I went to the Olympic That's Training incredible. Center after high school, went <clears throat> straight to the, the OTC for Greco-Roman wrestling. Um, started fighting, uh, was the youngest guy on the Ultimate Fighter TV show. Um, no and, shit. Yeah. Youngest guy? Yeah, well, uh, for the heavyweights, 21 years old. Amazing. Um, 19 was when I started fighting professionally, MMA. And uh, a lot of wrestlers are a little older whenever they get into it, but I jumped right into it. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, this was before it was all regulated. Um, so it's kind of from the old school guys a little bit, even though I'm only 32 right now. Uh, I was at a fight. I was supposed to coach my opponent, or sorry, my the guy I was cornering had a staph infection. Mm. And... Uh, so I was the one chosen to go to the press release or the press conference and let him know he wasn't going to show up for weigh-ins because he was in the hospital on IVs um, because his his staff infection was so bad on his 
his uh, thigh, Mike. This is, comes from wrestling, jiu-jitsu a lot, not as much in boxing, the staph infections. But um, he literally had this huge divot in his thigh. Uh. Um, and the, the s- died from that stuff. Yeah, yeah this got all the way down into up. his femur bone. Uh. The staff got into his femur. Um, so he couldn't fight. The opponent started talking trash, saying that he ended up in the hospital one night early, that he was going to send him there the next night anyways. Um, the promoter came up to me and said, hey, you want a chance to shut this guy up? And I was like, man, I'm a wrestler. I'm not a fighter. I don't know how to do this. I just came here to be his wrestling coach. And the guy said, hey, if you, if you stand with him, you're going to get knocked out. This guy's a kickboxer. Don't stand with him. Put him on his back and beat him there. And he's talking to me like I'm actually taking the fight. I'm like, man, I came here to coach. And he's like, hey, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity to, to fight tomorrow night. Oh, that guy's the real, event. He's the real promoter, this guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? This guy was, yeah. He got you in a fight. Yeah, little 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 podunk show in, in Oklahoma. And, oh, my uh, God. ended up taking it. And the next night, it was about a minute and a half into the fight, and uh, put him on his back and then, then finished him with ground and pound. Next fight was kind of the same thing. An opponent I was, or a guy I was supposed to coach had a cold. The third fight, I was in Iowa, and I was actually in the stands. And I was 19 years old. Good I was God. Dr- drinking a beer with a fake ID. <laughs> and uh, the guy, the opponent, my opponent that night, went into the cage. And the promoter said his opponent that weighed in yesterday didn't even show up on the night of the fight. And so they were looking for someone that weighed over 206 pounds. And if there's someone in, in the stands that wants to fight, just raise your hand. So my, my friend looks at me and goes, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm wearing like a button-down shirt, jeans, uh, nice shoes, and I kind of raise my hand. And uh, he's like, what are you doing? So I literally had to borrow someone else's fight shorts. What are you I doing? had to borrow uh, someone else's jock and cup, <laughs> and I had to use a boil and bite mouthpiece, put it in a coffee cup or coffee pot, oh my God. and uh, boil it down. And so those are my first three fights. Wow, dude. Yeah. Listen, um, you know how fortunate you are, aren't you? Yes. You know most guys they don't finish like you. Normally they, they, they don't. They have normally that. That's the last three fights they have, and they're talking really funny for the rest of their life. Yeah. You're very fortunate. Man, I'm grateful. I'm grateful now that. Um, so you asked about fight for the forgotten, and what I've learned is that fighting against people for competition that's one thing, but it's a completely different thing. Fulfilling, um, for me at least, and that's why it's my life mission and life passion to fight for people. And so getting into that. Um, Mike, I got to go after five years of fighting professionally. Um, man, I ended up being a depressed, drunk drug addict, hooked on Oxy, um, went missing for eight weeks. Fighting didn't fulfill me like I thought it would. That childhood dream became a reality, hmm. turned into a nightmare of course. Um, because I lost all my money, became an addict, um, and win or, win or lose, I had an excuse to, to use. Um, and so hmm. I went missing for eight weeks. Like, literally, like, my parents didn't know where I was, best friend didn't know where I was, uh, family, girlfriend, no one knew where I was. Um, and I was hitchhiking from drug house to drug house in Colorado. Man, so deep into to Oxycontin. Um, and my best friend left me a voicemail saying, I can't believe you missed my wedding. I can't believe my best man didn't show up. Mm. And so I was that hooked on, on the opioids um, and almost took my life from that. Um, and then from there... Uh, that kind of scared me sober. Went back to my fight team. They voted me off. It was 34 to 1. Um, and that was like some of the best fighters in the world. Shane Carwin, Brendan Chobb, mm. um, Nate Marquardt, Dwayne Bang Ludwig, Rashad Evans. Um, some big name guys uh, voted me off the fight team. Mm. And uh, so that was kind of rock bottom for me. Uh, that nightmare was even being taken away from me, uh, which was just my identity was being a fighter. And so then I started volunteering at different things. And by happenstance, I ended up living uh, 11 months later after being so, uh, a bit sober and um, big life change. Um, ended up in the Congo, living in the rainforest uh, with the pygmy people, uh, the hunter-gatherers, um, and got adopted in as family with them. Mm. Um, and uh, Wait a minute, dude. Yeah. How did you just <laughs> end up there? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how did, you, how did the encounter <laughs> happen? Mm. The encounter with you and the pygmy. Okay, well... I do want to talk about staying with Raiden, but I got to share this then. Yeah, um, yeah. we got plenty Matthew. of time, dude. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Go tell us. I mean, this is fascinating. So how did you <laughs> <laughs> I end up in the Congo, meet the pygmies, get adopted into the family? Yeah, it so was wild. How did you get to the Congo? What was it that? Did you buy a plane ticket and said, I'm going to the Congo? Or, like, I, how I did, did that come I, about? I did that, but 
it was something absolutely wild um, that that got me up to that point. What was uh, it? I've been I've been a little timid to share it out there publicly because I know it sounds wild. It's uh, say it's it, crazy. brother. If you um, can say okay, it, well, say so, it. So so uh, eleven months. Mike, you probably did visualization, right? A lot of Every visualization. Every day of my life. Every day of your life. Every day. Okay. Yesterday, today, this morning, I'm right before I come here. Okay. Sometimes well, during the day here, I would do it. Yeah. Yep. Well, yep. so at, before I'd go wrestle, uh, we had sports psychologists at the Olympic Training Center that would take you through visualization drills, like see what color singlet you're wearing, your your wrestling uniform. Is it red or is it blue? The two two colors that they allow mm. at the Olympic level. See yourself shaking hands with your opponent. You walking out on the mat. What, what's the sounds? What's the smells? You know, what's what's your game plan? How are you setting that up? Um, how what's your first tie up and your first setup to your first takedown? Okay, he got the takedown. How do you reverse it? And you see this in your mind a hundred times before you ever go do it or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this was unlike anything I'd visualized because I wasn't coached into it. Um, all of a sudden, it just happened. Um, and I was 11 months into this kind of life change. I had stopped fighting and I thought I was going to stop fighting for a year. Well, this was 11 months in. And so I started looking for a fight again. Um, and I, man, all I did was I said this quick, simple sort of prayer where I said, God, what do you want me to do with my life? That's all I said. And man, I had a movie in my mind that I didn't try to conjure up. Mm. I didn't try to fabricate. All of a sudden I was taken to the forest and I was walking down this footpath, and then all of a sudden I heard drumming, and I keep walking down this footpath in the forest, and I clear like thickets out of the way, and then I hear singing, a very distinct kind of little, almost yodeling type singing, mm. and then I come into this clearing, and uh, and I, I meet a guy, um, or I see him, and I see his ribs kind of poking out, and he's coughing, and I knew that he's sick, and my eyes just adjust, I see these twig and leaf huts, and then I just was flooded with this knowledge of who these people were, that they were hungry and thirsty and poor and sick, oppressed. And I knew that I knew that they were enslaved, that they called someone else master. And then I felt that they felt forgotten. That's all I knew was forgotten. I grabbed this piece of paper and I write forgotten on the top of it and hungry, poor, sick, oppressed, thirsty, enslaved. And then, and before I ever wrote that, I just came out of that vision just crying unlike I've ever cried in my life. For these people that I don't know, I don't know who they are, where they are, but I, I left a little, I like that much of, of tears. I don't, you can't call that a puddle, but I mean, a, a, a pretty big size of tears. I just was crying, didn't know these people, but my heart, all I can say was my heart was like shattered for them emotionally. I was wrecked and I had no idea why, who they were. Um, and for, th- for three days, I felt crazy because it had been 11 months since I had tried any psychedelics. Um, I hadn't. I tried to conjure this up. I wasn't in a visualization drill with a sports psychologist. All of a sudden, I was just lit up with this vision. Mm. I felt nuts for three days. Couldn't tell anybody. And, and three days later, this guy named Caleb, who had put on, like, survival trainings uh, around the world, like survivalist stuff. Mm. And uh, he was friends with Bear Grylls, mm-hmm. uh, like the man versus yeah. wild guy. And he was a humanitarian, missionary-type guy. And uh, I met Caleb, and... I'm like, man, this might be the guy I could tell. He's kind of a crazy guy. <laughs> and so I tell Caleb, and he gets kind of perked up. And um, he goes, I know who they are. And I said, what? And he goes, those are the, the pygmy people. And I said, who? And he goes, they're in the Congo. And I was like, where? I hadn't <laughs> been to the Congo. I hadn't been, I had never heard of the pygmy people at this time. And he goes, I'm so, he goes it's so crazy because I'm supposed to go see them in three and a half weeks from now. Mm just over three weeks from now. He goes, but the team I was taking of men, they're, the three guys with them were all husbands and all fathers, and they canceled their trip because mm. the rebels had taken over the airport that they are flying into. Over wow. a million-person city had been overtaken by rebels. He's like, the State Department said no American for any reason should travel to the Congo. Mm. Um, and so he goes, look, my wife was telling me I should cancel my trip unless... I, I get some sort of sign that I'm supposed to go. He goes, look, man, if you go, I'll go. And I was like, what? No. Well, first I told him no, because it was crazy. It was too out there. Like, it's dangerous. I don't know who these people are, where they are. Um, and so anyways, three uh, and a half weeks later, I tell Caleb, and I told a guy named Colin. And three and a half weeks later, we're taking numerous planes there. Um, we, we land on a runway that literally they cleared with machetes. That was how they mowed the lawn there. 
monkeys are jumping off the runway. We land, we get on a truck, we drive like six hours. We get out, we get on a motorcycle for a couple hours. We ride across a canoe. Then all of a sudden we're hiking and we're hiking in and all of a sudden we hear drumming. Mm. And then we hear singing. Then we come into a clearing and the first guy we meet has tuberculosis Mm. and his ribs are showing and he's coughing and he's coughing. Um, and it all the way down to the fact that Caleb and Colin were grabbing me saying, this is your vision, yeah, bro. This is your vision. Yeah. And I felt like this is nuts. Uh, did I have some sort of mental break or mental lapse? Like what's going on with me? Um, but even the chief pulled us to the side and said, Hey, everyone else calls us the forest people. We call ourselves the forgotten. Mm. And when he said forgotten, that was what I had written at the top. Top of that piece of paper was forgotten on the vision. Um, and so I knew known then that like for some reason, for some purpose, like I felt like I was brought there, but I doubted it for quite a while. Um, because coming back the first time, kind of the visual I had was I could try to help these people that have such significant suffering that I could spend my whole life trying. And the visual I got was that it was like emptying the ocean with an eyedropper mm. and like, how long is that going to take? Mm. And if I spent my whole life doing it, would it really make an impact? But man, it's, it's been wild. Like Mike, I've had a, a little boy named Andy Bo pass away. Um, I was cupping the back of his head and holding his little hand and he passed away just because of water, mm-hmm. dirty water, dirty water. Infection. Dirty water. So, and his, his mom was malaria? sitting there with me. Was no, it was just a water borne disease. I've had malaria now three times. What is that um, like? Malaria. Oh bro. It's brutal. First time I had it, I vomited red and green. So it was blood and bile after like four or five days. Um, I lost 33 pounds in five days, um, 60, 60 to 70% or 65 to 70% of my bloodstream were parasites. Um, and so my kidneys were failing, my liver was failing, my veins were collapsing. They couldn't get IVs in me. Um, and then, uh, I had black water fever, which is a side effect of malaria, 25 to 50% of the people that get black water fever, they die. Um, so I was one of the few lucky ones. And, uh, um, but whenever I finally was able to urinate, um, uh, it was pitch black. That's why black water fever. It was like motor oil or something, but I couldn't urinate for five full days. And then whenever I did, it was that color. So it was brutal. Uh, the joint pain, unlike anything you can imagine, your neck, your shoulders, uh, your elbows, joint. your wrist joints, like just radiating pain. And you feel like if we we're in this room right now, it would feel like we were on a, a ship that was like eight, 10, 12 foot waves. Um, on a boat like you're just rocking and your your fever goes way up uh, for a short time maybe 30 minutes or an hour and then it plummets and goes to where you're you're freezing so uh, actually when your fever is up that's when you're cold and then whenever your fever plummets to like 96 that's whenever you're hot you're just overheating Mm. Um, and so malaria was brutal the three times I had it first time almost killed me the second third time weren't as bad Um, but yeah I've had amoebas intestinal parasites um, and a bunch of different stuff. But hey, this is stuff they deal with on a daily basis. Wow. Like I've had it, but but they are losing loved ones to it. Mm. And so since then, Fight for the Forgotten, we've been able to get back their land rights, um, over 3,000 acres of land uh, for the pygmy people. Amazing. Um, and we're helping them drill wells. So we've drilled 61 water wells for them and then started up four working farms um, so three are fully sustainable that are supplying uh, different things like corn, beans, rice, uh, bananas to the local markets. And then whenever they're able to sell that, um, first they're able to eat it for themselves. Then they're able to sell it for others to eat. And then from that, they make money to where they can buy school, pay school fees or buy school uniforms so their kids can go to school for the first time. Um, but yeah, I got to live in the twig and leaf huts with them for over a year. So I've been doing this since 2011. And... Um, one time I went for a full year and the other times you go for maybe a month or two months or, or three weeks. Um, and what we'd really try to do is just to empower the locals mm. because they're the ones that want to be the change they want to see in the world or in their community or in their country. And the thing is that I've learned real quick is there's a great book called when helping hurts. You can try to help, but in the long run you can hurt mm. if you don't do it in appropriate, sustainable ways. And so, uh, for instance, in just water wells, if you look at that, um, there's over 230,000 broken wells in Africa right now. Mm. Over 230,000 broken wells that are minimum $5,000 each. And so it's billions of wasted charitable dollars. 
And the reason it's wasted is because the locals weren't educated with the knowledge how to do it for themselves. Mm. They weren't equipped with the tools to, to be able to do it for themselves. And they weren't empowered with, with like a self-sustaining business in country. They have to depend on the outsiders to do it for them. Mm. And so if a well breaks down after 11 months, which they normally do, you have to really um, have the locals, like, like changing oil after mm. 3,000 miles, you have to be able to, to, to maintenance the well. It might just be a small nuts and bolts kind of quick fix. Um, but if they don't know how to fix it, right. it's never going to be fixed. So, <sighs> whoa. What do you think about that vision? Either one of you, because I know that sounds I crazy. Totally, no, I mean, I think we both totally believe in that stuff. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. Um, I mean, we're not driving this thing, you know? We're not in not charge. At yeah. Not at all, no way. We're just passengers. Hmm. You don't so. even know why you're doing this. Yeah. You know, we don't even know why we do the things we do. <laughs> you know, nobody knows, but it's just the reason, the call to arms in a way. For me, a call to arms, like you said, uh, for me on the tough days, whenever I felt like, not necessarily quitting, but the really tough days that make you question why you're doing what you're doing, um, it might be easier for me to do some other things. Mm. Um, and uh, on those days you might want to question, I can go back to that thing that's outside of me that isn't just I want to do this, um, which is a great motivator. I want to do this. But it's I had this vision, and there's a reason and a purpose for it. And so after going there and living and after bearing Andy Bo, um, they gave me the name Efeosa Mabutimang Bo. And uh, so Efeosa means the man who loves us. And I love that one the most. I treasure that one. But Mabutimang Bo. It, uh, Booty man, boop. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Mabu- I love let me let me see if I can teach it to you. Mabuti man, boop. Mabuti man, boop. Yep. There you go. It's pretty close. Uh, that means the big pygmy. So uh, you're a big pygmy. There we go. How, how big are those guys? Know? Their average height's four foot seven. Really? For really? The men. men. For the men, four wow. foot seven. And here's what's so crazy: is people say Did the army brutalized them. Yes. Uh, now the 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 Congolese army or the Ugandan army. Ugandan. Uh, Ugandan, yeah, they they um, so the pygmy people live in nine African nations, yeah. huh. from Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, the other Congo. There's actually they two Congos. Them still, yeah, they do in a lot of areas. Can you imagine that black people enslaving black people? Wow, can you yeah. imagine? You just yeah. think of that. Yeah. There's over 200. So we don't we don't necessarily name the tribe normally. Whenever we do our work, we fight for the forgotten because in Congo there's over 200 tribes, mm. and only a few of them might be doing this. Um, but, uh, we say the Makpala, which mean non pygmy people. And then people say, how do they have this injustice that, um, that this is still happening? Even Chris Cyborg, who was here with mm-hmm. you guys, she came on our last trip to Uganda. I remember seeing him. some, uh, maybe while wow, 10 years, I remember seeing some documentaries about the harassment they were getting from yeah. the government's going in the bush and humiliating them and doing really bad yeah. stuff. Well, kicking them out of the forest yeah. in a lot of areas where they're the protectors of the forest. So to protect the forest, why kick out the protectors? But why the do the, you, how do the Ugandans, I know they have a border, but how do yeah. Ugandans get the right to cross the border and harass them? Well, so there's pygmies that live in, in Uganda, Uganda right. yeah, and then in, um, in Congo and in Central African Republic, Gabon, Cameroon. Did Uganda and... The Congos ever have a civil war with each other? They do not like each other. Yeah, I yeah. Like that. That's they've been uh, Congo's been exploited. They are the richest country on planet Earth. Yeah, um, mm. uh, for natural resources, yeah. for gold, diamonds, rubber. coal, tan, rubber. Yep, absolutely. Remember That's the where guy, the rubber started. Remember, guy used started. to cut his hand, cut their hands. Wow. What was his name? Leopold. Well, he used yeah, to cut yeah. Their yeah. Hands. King yeah. Leopold II. That's what Heart of Darkness is all yeah. about. Yeah, yep. yeah. And Leopold. King Leopold's Ghost is another yeah. great book. And and there's a picture that you're talking about that's so brutal because. Um, they think there was 20 million Congolese that lived in Congo when King Leopold oh, came Oh, he there. did a number on, oh, we well, can't eight, imagine. Eight to he, 10 he, million he, killed. That's why he did a number on him like in the 1870s yeah. and 80s and 90s. Yeah. He died in like 1902, wow. around that time Leopold yeah. died. And um, yeah, he did a number on those people. Yeah. And listen, he just went in there and did it without anybody, and they had to stop them eventually. Yeah. He just got too brutal. Well, people in Europe thought that King Leopold was like a hero. Yeah. Right, because um, he's cause bringing the light the into the dark. Yeah, and then they yeah. found out what yeah. he was doing. Yeah. And they said, whoa, look at that monster. Yeah, it killed eight to, or actually, um, yeah, eight to 10 million people, they think, like half the country there. And then the rest of the 50% that lived, 
um, half of them were missing one or more limb because if they yeah. were working hard enough, uh, they would no, cut off their hands. No, no. They would cut off their babies, their wives. Yeah. If you don't work and you don't bring me this amount of rubber today, I'm going to cut off your daughter's hand. Yep. I'm going to castrate your son. I'm going to do this. Yeah, absolutely yeah. brutal where, where the, the picture you're talking about, I think yeah. there's a bunch of them out there, but there's a, a father reaching out for his daughter. Oh, yeah, you saw that picture? Yep, he's reaching out for they his daughter. pieces. Yep, and his daughter's hands had just been cut off, and he's reaching out to her with his hands already yeah. removed. And so n no one has hands, and he's reaching out to his daughters who just lost her two hands. Um, like some of the most evil stuff you could ever imagine. Like uh, I don't mean to say this bad about the brand, Jameson, but, uh, but they even had um, one of the sons go out to the Congo, and he paid one of the okay. tribes Jameson whiskey. Uh -huh. uh, one of the sons of the Jameson family, he, his last name was Jameson, he sent out a tribe to go cannibalize the pygmies so that he could do it for artwork. So he sat by while they were cannibalizing a pygmy, um, and he, like, painted um, the atrocities happening to this person. So he, like, paid for it, and it was his viewing pleasure, and then he painted it out, so... One of the most evil things. Fuck think Jameson. Of. No, but listen, this is, um, check it out. I know we say fucking, but this is what, um, the elite people do. Especially in the 1900s, the Gilded Ages, they experiment on other human beings who are, who are inferior to them. Well, on that, in 1902 to 1906, people ask, how do they still suffer these kind of, um, atrocities? Or, no, yeah, still um, slavery. Yeah. Now black people are slave masters. Well, so in, in, in the Bronx Zoo, 1902 to 1906. Yeah. I actually think 1902 to 1904. They had humans there? Were the humans they used? Brody. It was a Mobutu yeah. pygmy named Otabinga yeah, from the area yeah. I lived. And they put him in the St. Louis World Fair from 1902 to 1904, 1904 to 1906. Yeah. He was in the Bronx Zoo, and they fed him bananas in the monkey house. So he yeah. literally lived with the monkeys right there. Yeah. Um, so just brutal. But what we're trying to do, even Chris... Uh, cyborg that was on the show she helped us drill our first two water wells in uganda for the pygmy people there the batwa pygmies had this been what is the history of the pygmy people so they the first pygmy what year was he in well anthropologists think they go back uh tens of thousands of years they're the first people group of even africa or at least the first people group of congo hmm. so they're the original citizens the first citizens and so similarly to how with Native Americans here, there's been land given to them for reservations. It was taken from them, right? It was all taken from them. And then they've been given land back that they can use and cultivate and, um, and that they own. Um, and it's the strongest thing in courts, like this is Cherokee land, or this is, uh, well, now we have 3,000 acres of Mabuti Pygmy land in Congo, and we have five acres started in Uganda, but we're looking at right now, because of Chris Cyborg and then also Dustin Poirier, um, Dustin Poirier has helped done a big fundraiser in his last fight um, in Abu Dhabi against Khabib Nurmagomedov. And uh, they auctioned off the gear for Fight for the Forgotten uh, and the Good Fight Foundation, Dustin Poirier's organization. And they raised more than they thought. We set a goal at 25000 um, We raised, we blew past fifty. Then uh, Khabib donated his shirt for 100000 Dana White matched it for another 100000 so I think it raised like two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. It's amazing. Now, oh man, now we're going to be able to drill seven water wells, and we're going to be able to get back up to well, thirty acres of land is what we're shooting for, but we're even um, aiming at maybe a hundred acres of land there uh, to try to get back. But we have enough funding for thirty acres of land, so that way they can start up their own uh, farm. Because this is what was brutal: they were kicked out of the Simaliki National Forest in Uganda by the Ugandan Wildlife Authority. And they have reasons to do that, to protect the forest that was being cut down, to protect the animals that were being poached. But the pygmies aren't poachers. They only take what they need. Um, and then from there, they were put on one acre of land behind th over 300 people, given here's your one acre plot of land behind these slums. And then they're throwing out the, the sewage, and the sewage comes through their village. Um, and they have eight shelters for over 300 people. And so Chris and I were walking around and we, uh, we were walking over these mounds and Chris Cyborg stopped and said, what are these mounds? And she pointed down and, uh, dead people. Well, yeah, they live on top of their grave, yeah, uh, their graveyard. Mm -hmm. And so they've only been given one acre of land. They've dwindled down from over 300 people to only 151 people in that area. 
Um, and the chief was literally like, or King Zito is his name, N-Z-I-T-O, Zito. Um, he was saying, hey, if we don't get land soon and have clean water and be able to farm for oursel- ourselves, we've always hunted and gathered. We can't do that anymore. We've got to be able to farm for ourselves. If we can't do that soon, our people group isn't going to exist anymore here. That's crazy to think so, my race of people is no longer going to exist. Yeah. Isn't that wild? He literally drew in the dirt his his dream and his big audacious dream was land, water, food. And we're like, man, well, we've done that in the past. We can do that here. All we need to do is have um, rally rally support. And so what would some bums do to be what would some people do in other countries to be just a homeless bum in America? Hmm. Hmm. They would give their life to be homeless and a bum in America. Can you imagine? Yeah. I, I I've said this before, like women are walking um, miles and miles a day. Uh, children can't go to school because they're walking um, with 40 liters um, or 20 liters, which is five gallons. But a lot of times they carry two at a time, two of those buckets. 20 liters is five gallons. Five gallons is 44 pounds when, when full. So they're walking day in and day out two, three times a day with 44 pounds or 88 pounds of water. Do people come and rob them of their water and abuse them and stuff? It happens, but normally um, normally not because, oh, where we go and where we drill, we always drill wells for both sides, both tribes or everyone in the area, so it's communal. So this way it's not property of one person Have or this or that. Have they ever some good food before those people? Yeah, uh, well, a lot of times whenever they're able to hunt and gather in, in I'm Congo. Some food like we eat, some food fat burgers anything like oh, that. Oh no, no, none of that. But I'm telling you some wild bush meat, uh, whether it's wild hog or antelope or monkey. I've had monkey before. Um, but fresh bananas and fresh sweet potatoes from the ground and uh, that that's pretty good. Um, goat, goat I think is a sweet meat. Goat is it's incredible. Real good. I used to eat goat when I was eating meat that was all I ate. All the Jamaican people love goat. Yeah. And absolutely. Goat. All my friends are Jamaican. We all eat we all eat that goat shit. Yeah, it's sweet. It's a sweet meat. I like it a lot whenever it's grilled. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of our, our our overarching vision as a nonprofit is to defeat hate with love, and our mission is to knock out bullying worldwide. And we do that in two areas or two initiatives, which are for the pygmy people, who anthropologists say are the most oppressed people group on planet Earth. Another way you could say that is the most bullied. And then here stateside, we have a bully prevention and character development uh, initiative. So it's community development for the pygmy people, and it's character development here stateside. Um, In martial arts academies, we wanna be in boxing gyms, we wanna be potentially in public, private, online schools with a curriculum for kids that basically says, um, well, the name of it is Heroes in Waiting. And what that means, the premise is, a hero isn't someone with supernatural powers, superhuman strength, It's someone who simply sees a need and takes action. They don't sit back and wait whenever bullying's happening. Here's a great statistic our kids need to know, or anybody needs to know, is 87% of the time you stand up and say something, one thing. As easy as, Evan, if you're bullying Mike, I just say, hey, that's not kind. Saying something as simple as that, hey, that's not kind, 87% of the time it shuts it down within five to 10 seconds. Mm. And so recognizing when you're being a bystander, and knowing that if you are a bystander, like with Raiden, what happened, he was beat up in the, the bathroom, standing by the urinal. And he's a kid with special needs. He's 12 years old. He's got autism. Why did they beat him up? They, they shouldn't have. This has been happening for, for years since, since he was a, a little different guy. Different tribes people? No, no. This is actually here. His name's Raiden. Oh, okay. And it happened in Oklahoma. And so kind of shifting to that, our stateside initiative, um, Raiden was in the bathroom at the urinal. Um, 10 or 12 people are, are, are in the bathroom, four or five people are filming it, and he just gets pummeled right by the urinal by this other kid that's a big kid. The next day, yeah, let's pull that up so we can oh, show I don't want to see this poor kid get beat up, man. Oh, fuck. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a good story that comes from it, so I might be able to show you the good stuff. But, yeah, so it's uh, – it's something that's on our heart is how do we empower kids to recognize when you're being a bystander? Because um, the tough thing is, is that they're, if they're not educated or equipped with the right tools to say something, they won't. 
where they'll think that they'll wrongly think they're being, they're just uh, innocent. They're an innocent bystander. Whenever really, if you're standing by and watching, or even if you're ignoring it, you're not an innocent bystander. You're a silent supporter. Mm. You didn't choose it. It chose you, but now you're presented with a choice. Am I going to do something or am I going to do nothing? Mm. And if I choose to do nothing, that is doing something that's being a silent supporter. And so you have to say something, whether if you're a kid, go report it, you know, to the proper school authority. But man, you can also speak up and use your voice. And that's the most powerful thing against bullying. Saying, hey, that's not kind. Hey, stop that. Or hey, instead of the person being excluded, being an includer where you invite them over in your group or sit at your table, or you go sit with them when they're all alone. And so when that's being a hero in waiting, you know, or a hero in action is not sitting by and doing nothing. Are you ready? Here's this kid raiding. Oh, fuck. Oh, oh. shit, that part's over now. But, um, this is this is Thursday night, and then this is uh, Raiden, 12, born with autism or uh, born deaf in his right ear, has a hearing aid, is diabetic, been bullied since he was nine. This is on the uh, the yard. The very next day, so Thursday was in the bathroom. This is Friday, and um, three kids on him at once. Um, and yeah, they found him with, with a Sharpie mark on his arm. Because of the bullying, um, he's wrote on his arm, like, I want to kill myself. And um, so we live in the same hometown in Oklahoma City. And uh, they've, um, they asked us to get involved and to see him. But what's been kind of cool is, have you ever heard of Rafael Lovato Jr.? No. So he is the current Bellator champion. Uh, he's right there on the left. Oh, uh, man. And so this was a few nights later. Uh, Raiden got to hold Rafael's current Bellator championship. He's the middleweight champion, oh, beat Gegard That's Musasi. So awesome. That's one of my training partners and coaches. He's the best American, or at least the most accomplished American, to do jiu-jitsu. He's got numerous world medals. I think six of them are, are gold medals in jiu-jitsu. And then, uh, and then he's the current MMA uh, world champion. So that's his little brother, Brock, uh, on the right. Um, Raiden's 12, his little brother's nine. Raiden's a big kid. I mean, that's, uh, I'm, I'm 6'2", 6'3", 250. <laughs> Raphael's the 185 world champion, and uh, Raiden is 12 years old. He's a big kid, uh, but he's a sweetheart. Um, if you go back or next, um, actually, if you keep going, I'll be able to show you. That's, uh, that's actually the next night. So Tuesday, his school was canceled. This is Wednesday night. Tuesday, his school was canceled because of death threats at the school because all this went so crazy. People were cyberbullying Raiden and his family, or not just him, but the, the bullies. People started posting the address of the 12 and 13 year olds online saying, go get them. Um, <laughs> and so uh, his dad asked Raiden if he was going to go to church the next night. And Raiden goes, no, dad, what are the kids from school going to say? Uh, school was canceled because of me. I've been bullied and beat up. I can't go back to even church. And I go, what if I go with you, bud? And uh, he looks at his dad, can I? And, I? and his dad goes, yeah. And he looks at me and says, can I wear a shirt like you? And I'm like, yeah, buddy. So uh, we went to his church and like 300 kids heard he was coming out. They all came to support him. Um, I got to speak for like five, 10 minutes, share my bullying story, share about how we can rally around Raiden. And uh, he got a standing ovation from 300 kids at his school. Um, and afterwards we're leaving and some of the girls asked him, hey, Raiden, how are you? He goes, I'm okay. And they go, are you coming back next week? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll come back. And uh, after that, he goes, dad, did you see that? And he goes, yeah. Um, and we sit in the car and I go, Raiden, what's, what was your favorite part, bud? And he goes, well, everyone cheering for me. That made me want to cry. But the girls, definitely the girls. That was my favorite part. Um, and so we're just trying to rally support around him where, you know, he was sitting there depressed. His grandpa named Butch, that's his dad, Danny. But Butch uh, was an old bull rider, um, and he says it's made his heart want to fall out of his chest that at nine years old was the first time his grandson talked about wanting to kill himself hmm. um, because he's been bullied for, for most of his life. Um, so uh, we're just trying to put love and compassion in action and have a, a bunch of people rally support around him. I mean, people have posted about Raiden from the Pittsburgh Steelers all posting a video for him, the L.A. Chargers. Uh, Rafael Lovato Jr., um, Baker Mayfield, 
Uh, Mick Foley is their favorite WWE wrestler. Um, he has a son that's autistic. Mm. He made a video for Raiden, sent it out, um, and uh, a lot of really cool stuff is happening. It's amazing, man. Yeah. Unless you've been living under a rock, you've known that the NFL is back and the NBA playoffs are in full swing, which can only mean one thing. It's winning season at MyBookie. To start winning, go to MyBookie. Just use the promo code Tyson. Claim your 100% deposit match all the way up to 1000 bucks. That means if you put 100 bucks in, you get another 100 bucks. It's easy. Easy way to jumpstart your bankroll. NFL, NBA, MLB, they all got it all. They're never too late to start your own winning season, exclusively at MyBookie. Mike, have you heard of uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy? I was in a hyperbaric chamber before. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I've been in that, yeah. This is with Raiden. Uh, I was actually with him at the doctor. Why is Raiden in here? Why is he in there? Because he was actually diagnosed with a concussion. Yeah, yeah a concussion. So I was, I was, brain cells are dead. Hmm. So they, they said that uh, hyperbarics were one of the best things for him. Did yeah. someone give him a concussion? Uh, from one of those fights. Oh, fuck. Yeah, so um, uh, I was helping get him, getting him down. Uh, he had never done it before. And I, I'm one of those guys that thinks everything happens for a reason. And so I just started too, hyperbarics. One of those guys. You're one of those guys? Yeah. yeah. No accidents. No accidents. So I had just started going two or three times. And then uh, the doctor said hyperbarics would be great for him. I was like, I have an appointment today. And uh, if we can get him a prescription, I'll take him with me. And so uh, I was able to help him. He hasn't been in a plane before. So we brought him down and um, been just trying to rally support around him. There he is with someone's uh, sunglasses Eskimo now. Joe's. <laughs> Eskimo Joe's. You know about that? <laughs> in Oklahoma. Yeah, he's a big Oklahoma fan. He just wants to be loved. That's it. Yeah. And love people. My God. So that's our mission, man, is to defeat hate with love. And how can we do that in the most practical tangible way whether that's um for the most bullied people group or whether that's here for kids that are being bullied stateside because what's nuts about just in the u.s the number two cause of death for ages 10 I'm to bullied. 14 I'm bullying yep suicide yeah. uh teen addiction teen depression teen isolation um teen like self like uh what's that mutilation yeah it's it's degradation and all that stuff it's through the roof, higher than ever before. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to say that. I will say, like, um, you know, um, that's why we have so many help groups, and we got the, the Earl Nightingale and all these guys, the, the Justin, um, the guy Perry. with Perry, and all these guys, and the Shushtagura. Sadhguru. Sadhguru and those guys, because people need, the, people need an outlet. People need help. Yeah. People need to find something bigger than outside themselves and that's inside themselves to help them live another day. Yeah. Because we're looking for all of our happiness and to solve all our problems out here in the outer world. And all the problem solving is, has to be done inside of the inside job. Yeah. Hmm. When this out here, this disturbed this in here, is normally over, it's finished. Hmm. The objective is to keep the outer world from disturbing the inner world. Yeah. I like that a lot, that it's an inside job. Yeah, all big time inside no job. There's so many, I think, especially with social media and yeah. cyberbullying, right? Like, whenever we were being bullied growing up, like, you could escape it when school was over. It's go home. But now yeah. it increases. And I think comparison, what's that quote? Um, I think it's like Teddy Roosevelt or something like that says, comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And, like, all these kids on social media, they're just comparing up, right, to everyone else's highlight reel, even if it's a fabricated mm -hmm. highlight reel. Um, and so Do you think that's the why there's so much bullying now? I think that's one of the main reasons. Social media? Yeah. Or at least that's one of the most active ways to do it because you can be anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, or it, even if it's not anonymous and you're truly doing it with your identity, you are almost numb to the real effects because it's not a person-to-person, face-to-face interaction. So you can hide behind your, right. your there's a buffer there behind your, your smartphone yeah, or whatever. And so 180,000 kids, 180,000 in the U.S. alone skip school every day because of bullying. I skip school. Yeah, I skip bullying. school big time. Three million bullying, school days lost yeah. a month. Mm. Uh, 12 million uh, American students will be bullied this year alone. I, this is what I did when I used to get bullied for school. I would go to school for breakfast, 
when breakfast is over, I will leave the school and wait outside the school until lunchtime. Lunchtime I'll go, I will go eat lunch. Boom, lunchtime, I will wait at school. When the school is over, I will go get my books and I go back home. Mm. Wow. I would never go into school because they would fucking kick my ass. And I had to get the food. Once I got the food, I got the food and I left. Because they had it before their class came and saw me in the, 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 the lunchroom. I didn't want them to see certain people to see me in that lunchroom. Because they were going to just come and attack me, take my food. Then they beat your ass right in front of everybody. No one does anything. They just beat your ass. Just like that. But they do it right in front of the, um, the cafeteria. The teachers, the guards, they're beating your ass. You know, so I always made sure I got the food and I was out before that class came down. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I would, uh, after that bullying moment where I was dressed up like the Dr. Pepper uh, Transformer, I literally ran away from that party. My parents had to I'm find sure. me at, at Dairy Queen afterwards. I had ripped it all off, thrown it in the, uh, the dumpster. I had like the duct tape residue still on my shirt and jeans and stuff like that. I was just sitting there crying, just sobbing. I skipped school until I think that was on the weekend. I think it was Thursday or Friday when my parents finally sent me back. But there's a thing called the diffusion of responsibility, I think is what it's called in psychology, where when there's a group, people take on less personal responsibility to do something about it because there's a group and someone else could do something. Mm. And what we need to know is like have that primed in our mind that even though there's other people that could do something, I'm going to do something whenever I see bullying taking place. Is it human nature? Bullying? You think this is Absolutely. Like animals do it. Humans, you do it. You know, certain animals, they bully their brothers and sisters and stuff. And then as they get older, they love each other and fight to the death for each other. Mm. Someone have to, somebody has to um, determine who's the boss and that find a way and that development of who they are in life. Somebody have to develop, I'm the boss or he's the boss. It's, it's just no way. It's just that's how it's always been from animals, brothers and sisters. Some animals, I think it's her, um, hyenas, they fight in the womb. They have they may have seven babies. One or two might come out because they're fighting. They're fighting in the womb. They'll kill each other before yeah. they get out. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably where the big challenge comes from, right? Like battling that nature versus us being civilized human beings now. Yeah. And needing to. Uh, to, to shift in a way that, okay, we know that this now through science and through studying it, we know that this has long lasting detrimental effects. But it's fear based. Yeah, absolutely. It's all fear based. Even in yeah. the womb with them animals, it's all fear based. Am I going to get out of here? I'm going to kill them. I got to get out of here. Yeah. It's all fear based. Everything's yeah. fear based. If you ever just, hey, it's cool it out. This is my brother. I love him. He loves me. And we're going to get out. It's we'll both be out. okay. It's pushing us out. It's okay. It's okay. But they can't ration. Animals don't ration. Mm-hmm. They don't. Ra- they don't have no rationalization. They can't do that stuff. Well, there's that, and then there's also a trickle down happening, isn't there, from oh, the yeah. parents, mm-hmm. from their parents? Yeah, I don't, I don't doubt about it. What I had to tell Raiden um, because he couldn't really understand um, how he was treated so badly by a group of mm-hmm. people. Like the thing that happened in the bathroom, even though it was on school property, that one affected him less than whenever there was these two guys beating him up and this girl hitting him from behind and then everyone filming it. And I had to tell him, you know, buddy, um, we have this thing we do. We fist pound and then we say buddies and we do like two pounds on our chest, just fist bump buddies. And uh, I said, well, you know, buddy, sometimes um, this is what I've learned through my bullying moments is that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that are going on and I won't say who, but, one of the people from that video, um, if you look into their background, like someone in their family very close to them, one of their parents were murdered by their other parent. Mm. And so they're in a very tough life yeah. circumstance of their own, and they should have probably been removed from school the year before, but because of that tragic instance in their life, they've kind of been given a little bit of some free passes a bit maybe. Um, and. And then they're, they're struggling, they're hurting, and so they act out by hurting others. And if you look into the statistics from the CDC, um, number three on the suicide list for like bullying moments, and the third at risk is the bully. The second is actually the victim. And you're like, well, who would be number one? Well, actually, number one at highest risk of suicide is the person who does both. They're being bullied, and then they're not happy with themselves, so they act out by being a bully to others. Mm. So that person is the highest at risk 
of suicide, the person that is being bullied and then they become a bully mm. because they're not happy on either side. And so they're at this constant internal struggle with who they yeah, are. Yeah, but we don't talk about this guy. You, know, you remember this because what about the guy that kills the bully? Hmm. Hmm. That guy too, the guy that kills the bully. And sometimes um, I saw him one time on television, um, it was this guy, he was beating up the guy. I, I forgot his name. And he even, took, he even took sexual advantage of some of the girls in the group of them. And they just made a plan one day that we're going to get him. And so the guy had made a plan for us to go out again, and they called that guy to come in, and they killed him. Mm. It, was, it, was on, uh, it was on the 2020 before I saw it. Mm. So it's, it's not always that someone's getting bullied. Sometimes people fight back, and then they spend the rest of their life in jail. From mm. being bullied, from defending you for they they went too extreme. They mm. didn't go to the cops. They didn't go to their parents. They put it in their own hand. <laughs> that was a smart idea, and they killed the guy. Well, I think that's a, one of the big struggles with yeah. school shootings. Mm. If you look at school shootings, you'll yeah. see yeah. Uh, seventy-five percent of the time or more, they were relentlessly bullied at exactly. school, and this was their moment of revenge. Not given attention as well. They yeah. haven't been given attention they believe they deserved. Mm. Yeah. So they've been good and nice to those people, and they haven't received the same in return. Yeah. So, Justin, from that perspective, how are you building the character mm. of this next generation? Well, that's what we're really excited about. We worked with uh, Century Martial Arts, um, and they are the number one distributor of martial arts goods in the world. Mm. So if you buy anything at Dick's or um, Academy, they've made most of it. Mm. Um, and they supply most of the martial arts academies around the country. And one thing that I think boxing, wrestling, uh, jiu-jitsu does that maybe maybe football, football develops character for sure, mm. without a doubt. But I think the coaching um, in martial arts, like there's lessons before, during, and after mm. practice about character, about discipline, about respect, about um, – treating others like you'd want to be treated. Even the black belt journey is about service to others. Mm. And so um, I love that about martial arts. And so we worked with Century Martial Arts and another organization called Maya, the Martial Arts Industry Association. And they've helped us develop this curriculum that's 12 weeks of teaching. And then every class they have a mat chat, so a mat discussion. And so there's a teaching and then there's also a challenge. There's a hero's challenge after every heroes in waiting lesson. And so they'll be like this week and it's all digital too. So they can watch it on their smartphone going into practice. We coach the coaches how to coach it. Then there's a video for the parents. There's a video for the students that are learning. So the parents can be engaged with what their child is learning and the student can know what they're learning that week and what their hero challenge is. And so what I love about that is they come in week one, recognize when you're being a bystander. And so recognize that, come back and report it. Another hero challenge will be go out and complete a secret random act of kindness so the rule is you have to be completely anonymous and you have to go do something great that makes someone feel awesome and what was that journal it you know what'd you do how'd you stay anonymous how'd that make them feel how'd that make you feel and then how are you going to build on to that next week and so it's all all digital but there's also a curriculum that's all typed out um, and so we're arming oh, right now 104 martial arts academies are using it around the country um, and now we're just trying to fundraise so that way we can get it up to school standards um, and, and get it into public, private, and online schools, uh, get it accredited. Um, and so that's what we're working with our board now. That's awesome. Um, I guess outside of that, how do we cultivate kindness mm. and goodness in young people? I think so that it's not just like, okay, you're in a situation and a kid's being bullied. Are you going to no, be a listen, bystander? This is what they do. This, they know how to do this. You get programs. Hmm. Kids and kids would join the program. And the programs would keep teach everybody um, the golden rule. Hmm. You know the program, but they, the but the government always um, pulling these programs out. The more programs I think are the better for the children. It'd be less drug, it'd be less killing, it'd be more programs, more con conglomerates, more people being friends, more people meeting each other. And that's what it is. So many people disenfranchised with each other. Mm -hmm. They're so far away from each other, they can't be together and they're looking, they want, they, their minds are reaching for each other, but we're also disenfranchised. And that's what the programs do. 
Well, I love this. There's a you you just triggered a, a, a Swahili proverb in my my mind, my memory. Um, the pygmies taught me this. It says, if you want to go fast, go alone. Mm, mm. But if you want to go far, go together. Mm. Mm. And so we need these programs. We need everyone to come together. And then what I've learned there from living there for a year is the community. It's so important. And we're so used to isolating or being individuals that we'll do things on our own. And in the rainforest, you don't have privacy. Your, your home is literally twig and leaves. Your wall are leaves. Mm. And so you can hear the discussions between people all across the village. There isn't any private conversations. And that can be a bad thing, but it's also a good thing that you aren't able to isolate and completely yeah. um, cut yourself off from, from the community. And so you need each other. Um, but I also think it's really important for each individual to learn their personal impact. You can impress people from a stage or from uh, maybe on a podcast, but you impact people one-on-one -on -one in conversation or up close. And so what I mean by that is we could teach these kids, uh, whether it's in a program or whether it's in a conversation with them, that no act of kindness, no act of kindness, no matter how small ever goes wasted. Mm -hmm. Right. And so start small. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten to start this organization fight for the forgotten. Now it's going to be what I do for the rest of my life. But I started with that quote, mm -hmm. no act of kindness, no matter how small ever goes wasted. And so one thing I like to ask people is in the lives of others, if you knew you could, if you knew you could in the lives of others, what great difference would you make if you only knew you could? So it, it's that whole, that whole quote, you know, um, what would you do if you knew you wouldn't fail? What would you do if you knew you wouldn't fail? And, and so take all the fear of failure away. Well, now, what difference would you make in the lives of others if you didn't have fear that you wouldn't be able to do it? And so what impact do you want to make? How do you want to influence people? How do you want to change their lives? And, um, and so do that. No act of kindness, no matter how small, ever goes wasted. Start small. I love start it. somewhere. And uh, just have your head on a swivel. Yeah. Looking to make a difference wherever it is you can. I love that. I always tell my son, I always tell all my kids that if you're just somewhere, I don't care where you're at. Never think, um, why am I here? You think when you get there and you observe the situation you're in, say, how can I make this a better place? Hmm. Wow. That's how, it. Can, how can I make these people better at what they do? Yeah. And I know that sounds like, I don't fuck if I care what they do. But imagine, imagine your brain working mm -hmm. to make this place better. Yeah. And make these people better than they could ever be in their life. Yeah. And no one can do it but you because that thought came to your mind to make this better. It's perfect, but you can make this better. And that's your job to make this better. Hmm. I love that, Mike. You know what's really cool is that's even a principle now that I think can even be applied to businesses. Hmm. I was recently at both Lowe's in, in Charlotte, um, North Carolina, and Home Depot in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And both of them talked about something really similar, which kind of blew me away. But there's a new statistic out there that says, I think it's 84, 84% of consumers are now classified as consumers who care. What that means is they're mm. looking to buy a product or a service that's attached to a purpose, mm. that it's cause-minded, community-driven, that it's making the world a better place. And so if businesses can even align with that, if us as people can align with that, like you'll just make the world a better place. Yeah. Um, and so it's been really cool to see some of these businesses step up and say like, this is how we're going to give. Like we've got one guy that gives 10% uh, of his company back to us. It's awesome. Um, another person that gives a certain dollar amount per product sold. Um, and that, mm, that's, that's been nuts incredible. to see their sales increase from being uh, purpose driven or attached to a cause. I love that. That's our purpose here. That's our purpose. I always wanted to know what was the human purpose here. Mm. And it's to enrich the world. Yeah. Mm. Someone's yeah. going to come by one day and they're going to say, I can make us live for an extra hundred years. He's going to enrich the world in that. I don't know if that's enriching the world, but that would be a form of enriching the world. Absolutely. Mm. Whatever it is. It's what we're doing right now is a form of enriching the world. Mm. Yeah. And the way now, see, now we have this. You know how many millions and hundreds of million people know that he does this now? Hmm. That's enriching the world. Hmm. He touched millions of people, knows his idea what he's doing. Yeah. Even people in the Congo know now they didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, enriching the world with his love and caring for 
you know, humanity. Hmm. You know, it's powerful stuff, man. I think that's so important to remember. You know, is no act of kindness, no matter how small, goes you know, unnoticed. So it's crazy. You, you but it's, to, you know, you say like the universe allowed us to be born. Mm. Maybe we didn't want to be born, and now we're born, and now we got to worry and freak out about dying. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He put us here. We didn't have to be here, and now we're freaking out about dying. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Why do you do this to us? Why do you have me freaking out? Yeah. What's that saying, though? Uh, the most important day of your life isn't the day that you were born, but the day you found out why? Yeah. Something like that? The day yeah. you discovered yeah. why? Yeah, and I found out to enrich the world. Yeah. There's no, there's yeah. no doubt. Yeah. There's no doubt to enrich the world. I love that. That's easy to say. Yeah. Easy to live by. No, and this is what I found out too. Human beings, animals, yes, but fucking human beings won't set, won't accept, won't accept, um, they won't accept the answer unless it's complicated. Mm. If the answer's easy, they won't believe it. They say it's bullshit. You know what I mean? But our, our, our reality is in our mouth. Hmm. You know? I, I know this will sound probably pretty cheesy, but I, I need easy, simple things for me to remember. Exactly. Um, that's why our vision statements, defeat hate with love, is pretty easy. Defeat hate with love. Knock yeah. out bullying worldwide. Um, defend the weak. Love the unloved. Empower the voiceless. Like those kind of things. Um, but whenever I'd sign my book, I got to write a book called Fight for the Forgotten. And uh, whenever I'd sign it, it was a reminder to me, but I hope it would kind of be an awakening or a moment where if someone actually, what does this mean? That they would think about it and discover it, that it's almost too simple to live by. Yeah. But it's, I would sign it, live to love, love to live. And it was because I, whenever I was going through that, being that depressed drunk drug addict and hitchhiking from drug house to drug house and fighting on TV and getting my hand raised and thinking, is this it? Is this all? Like not having that sense of fulfillment uh, after a victory with that I thought would yeah, be there. No doubt about it. Listen, um, Dr. Seuss, the cat in the hat, he's Frederick Nietzsche in simple form. Mm. You know? Frederick Nietzsche, you try to read Frederick Nietzsche. You won't understand one fucking word when it comes out your mouth. Nobody here will understand one word. What did he say? You understand everything in the cat in the hat. That's Frederick Nietzsche right there, everything. The world right there. My my wife's been literally telling me I have to read the cat and oh the hat books. definitely I haven't read them definitely yet. oh that's the world okay it's the other world yeah. cat in the hat well that's it though if if you think about just those two things live to love love to live we're all wanting to love this one life that we live and so we get caught in what's that called like materialism yeah. We get caught in all this because we just, the new iPhone will make me happy. This yeah. new car will make me happy. This bigger home will make me happy. Um, for a moment. For a moment. But the thing is, is that if we change things up, if we live to love first, I think we'll, we'll love to live. It's about so. letting all this go. All this has to go. All the new phones, all the new clothes, the blunts, everything, the fancy, everything has to go. Mm-hmm. That's why at the end of the day, we're just, we're skeletons smiling. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, all of us skeletons with a big smile on our face. End of the day, mm-hmm. we're just passing through. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're going on a ride. You know, we're going to exist somewhere else, but not here in this physical world. That's when we're going to, as soon as we die, that's when we're going to begin to live. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just when we're going to start. So can, you ma- can, you, can you imagine dying and, and can you just imagine dying and waking up and being somewhere else? That's wild. After, I, after experiencing all this, can you imagine it's, we're not living no more, now we're somewhere else. Not I, knowing where, but we're there. Someone told me once that, and I, this might be a, a, a common quote, but I forget, I'm trying to think who told me it, but they said, we're not human beings on a spiritual journey, we're spiritual beings on a human, human journey. journey. Yes, no exactly. I was talking to my wife the other day. I was watching my son. He, he plays baseball. And so we're sitting down in the rafters, and so were the ants are there. And it's getting wintertime, so they're ready to hibernate now. But the all, all during spring and summer, they were, um, they were preparing, right? And I'm telling my wife that story, and I'm, when I'm going on, and I say, baby, you see this? They're doing all this under the midst of us, squashing them and stabbing them. They accomplished more than we could ever do in a lifetime within a season. And that's, that's being crushed and stomped by us. 
right? And I said, now, baby, listen to this. You see how we're watching them? Who's watching us? You don't think somebody's watching us? In perspective. Definitely. And I wanted to do the answer have somebody they look at that's very small, like we look at them. I wonder if there's a species of bug that's very small that the ants look at them and say, they're too small even to fucking eat. You know? And do they have somebody smaller than them that they say they're too small to even eat? They're just amazing to look at. Like we look at the bugs. Or we may just kill them for sport. You know? How many, how many, um, how many layers of that? The smaller, the smallest, the smallest, microscopic. How many layers does that go? Well, where does it start from us? Where does it go? Do the, do the clouds, is the universe, is the, the solar system? Where does it start when they're looking at us and we're microscopic? I don't know. You're blowing my mind. <laughs> well, but we, we can't think we're the, we can't think, listen, we don't like ourselves well enough to think we're the only strongest beings in the universe. Mm. We don't love ourselves enough to really believe we're the only ones. Yeah. You just, you just pulled another Swahili proverb uh, out of my memory um, about not believing in ourselves enough. Um, there's a Swahili proverb, and this, this means more to me because I've had malaria now uh, three times, and, and a bigger beast of an opponent that I've ever fought um, was, a, was a one gram or less than mosquito, right, that almost took me out, um, almost laid me out uh, permanently. Uh, but it says, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try to sleep in a closed room with a mosquito. Mm. <laughs> and so if there was one mosquito in this room with us right oh, now. Oh, he'll make a difference. Get the, my wife will forget this motherfucker out of here. <laughs> I said, baby, this is just a bug. What are you doing? Get him out of here. A bug. He doesn't eat too much. He doesn't eat much at all. He's going to die he ODing on you, eating off you. <laughs> you know, he's going to die. So chill. And so if that one bug can make that big of a difference in our lives, how much more of a difference can we make in the lives of others? Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Many people don't think that they have any power, hmm. you know? Hey, that's the power right there. That should let them know they have power hmm. because that's the power to show them they're nothing because they're being nothing. So hmm. tell that power to tell you you're something and you'll yeah. be something. Yeah. Absolutely. You remember what you told me? Whatever you think, right or wrong, you're good or bad, you're right. Yeah. Because you thought that. That's right. And that, that feeling of powerlessness. I think when kids are bullied growing up, those effects, those feelings, those beliefs of being powerless can last a lifetime yeah. if you let it. Yeah. If someone doesn't come along and show you yeah. Um, or you have some some moment of self-discovery that lets you know that, that, that you do have uh, power. Um, you know, bullies are just, no, I bully. See, people don't understand the real damage that bullies do. Bully, um, yeah. bullies, bullies make monsters. Hmm. Yeah. That's the biggest damage they do. Those little scared people turn into monsters. A bully couldn't even fathom the, the fear that that guy could imagine. You know. That's the real. Do you remember one significant bullying moment in your life? Oh. Hey, right, I'm not cool enough to see the guy that bullied me right now to this day. I might attack him right now. I'm 53 years old, I might attack him right now. He did a number on me. I, uh, I saw some of the bullies from that, that party. So I'm at a sushi restaurant after I got off the Ultimate Fighter TV show. I was visiting my hometown in Fort Worth, Texas, and um, I was at a sushi place, and it was crazy. It was almost that, that group of kids that set it all up, that pre-planned it, that methodically created an invitation that said costume party on it, knowing that it wasn't a costume party. It was mm. just to fool me. And so mm, there's a table of eight, eight or 10 of them. And the, the main kind of ringleader of that group 
that had set up numerous bullying moments for me um, the years before. He saw me, said, oh, why don't you come over, have a drink with us? I was like, no, that's okay. And he pointed over at the the table. I was like, no, that's okay. And, um, and I, I went to the restroom. And uh, actually, sorry, before I went to the restroom, he pulled me over to the table. It was all of them sitting down, and they kind of went around the table, and it was all something similar to this effect. But the guy that, that was the, the ringleader looked at me, brought me over there to the table. I stopped by just for a second. He said, hey, here's so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. You remember them? I'm like, yeah, I remember them. And he goes, hey, man, you know, we were just kids back then. Uh, if we knew you were going to be a fighter and you could have beat us all up, we would have never done that to you. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think he was trying to say sorry. <laughs> But what I got from that was if if he would have known that I could have whooped him, he wouldn't have done those terrible things to me. That's how I received it was, oh, if you knew there was a consequence, you wouldn't have done that. And so I remember from there, I went to the bathroom, said, oh, give me a minute, went to the bathroom. And just like when I ran away from that party after that moment, I like slipped out. I didn't slip out the back, but I found a way around in the restaurant to where they didn't see me leaving. Um, and so I couldn't even face them then. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not, I can't handle that. Um, yeah. Mm. Wow. I'm yeah. too insecure. I, I would be violent. You know, I'm just too insecure. I'm just too insecure. I'm too insecure. One of the, one of the reasons I'm in town, I'm going on Joe Rogan's podcast. I'm, I'm on with you guys. I'm so incredibly grateful. Um, it looks like Raiden, there's going to be some really cool stuff lining up for him, maybe with the Chargers, maybe with the talk, the TV show. There's a CBS show called Seal Team that might give awesome. him a studio tour. Take him on walks, hike with him. And yeah, stuff. yeah, go We're to the beach. Wait, make him feel positive his, by himself. His first time on a uh, airplane will be coming out here and take him to the beach for the first time, which is going to be great. But actually, Mike, there's this incredible doctor in Costa Mesa. His name's Dr. Daniel Amon. And uh, he did Muhammad Ali's brain, looked at it on scans. He's done tons of NFL players, like over 300, I think. And he can detect mild traumatic brain injury, all this different stuff. Mm. And he said, for a fighter, I have a really good brain. He had to do, I do three full days with him, his chief medical director, uh, his functional medicine doctor. But they did cheek swabs, hair sw- hair uh, samples, uh blood, urine, stool samples. They did the works on me trying to figure out what parasite I have in me because I've had cerebral malaria, which is the parasite that normally is in the liver, but it's gone into my head. I've had the intestinal bacteria, amoebas, amoebas up here too. Um, so they're doing the works on me, checking me out. Jesus, man. Um, but they literally can scan your brain and see where the blood flow is, where it's, where there's too much activity, where there's not enough activity and where it's functioning properly. But then they can detect on these scans, it's called a SPECT scan, and they can show you this 3D image of your brain. And it's almost like an MRI, but way different. It shows the function of your brain, not Mm. just the biology of your brain. And it can actually show you your emotional brain Mm. and where it's firing. And so they can see eight different types of brains that are ADD. I have severe ADD. Mm. Um, They can detect mild traumatic brain injury, uh, like then TBI, regular. Um, They can detect all this different stuff. But for me, they're able to detect PTSD. And so the way your brain's supposed to be lit up is supposed to be just a little bit of red, one spot that might have white. Well, my brain was all over the place, um, lit up everywhere. And there's a certain diamond in it. They show you what part of the brain it connects to and everything else on the underside and on the frontal, uh, all these different parts of the brain. But they showed me that I had a diamond of fire. And they say, if you have this ring of fire, that means 100% you have PTSD. You're supposed to have just one little red speck there. You've got it lit up, and you have it in a circle or in a diamond. And like, man, you have as much PTSD as, as military veterans that come in here and, and are really struggling with it. And I've had some terrible stuff happen growing up as a kid, but then even over in the Congo and in Uganda from rebel group interactions and being uh, held at gunpoint or... Um, rebels attacking a village next to us or taking women to the hospital after they've been tied to a tree and, and raped by numerous men and just like some really, really tough stuff seeing and, and digging graves for people and different things like that. Um, 
not really why I, I brought up Dr. Amen, but I know that, that he's an incredible doctor and he's helping me get a life balance of like a morning routine, supplements that help my brain. Um, there can be medications too, but he, that's his last line of defense is he wants to help create healthy brains because he says, um, if we can help you have a healthy, healthy brain, you'll have a healthy life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's helped a ton of different NFL, Muhammad Ali, a lot of different people. Um, and now he's helping me and my wife, so I'm very grateful for him. Amazing. <coughs> I wonder what I got. I know I'm a type of stuff. <laughs> you should go see him. He's right here in Costa Mesa. Shit. He he's really right is a phenomenal you. doctor. He's a, he's 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 a ten ten time New York Times bestseller. Really? Two two TED talks with millions of views. He talks to Google, to Success Magazine, Forbes. Um, he's not just some doctor. He is like the doctor. How do you spell his name? Brain scans. Amen. Like you're praying. Amen. A M E N. So it's Doctor Daniel <coughs> Amen, and he works with NFL players, fighters, all sorts of people. And he's done more brain scans than any human on earth, like over two hundred thousand different brains. Um, and that's where he's getting all this state of the art technology and able to write his books, like how how to heal your brain with high, the hyperbarics. They're finding that yeah. you can literally do brain trauma reversal. Mm through hyperbarics. I heard about that. Yeah, Yeah. this little girl named Eden Carlson. She drowned. She was gone for two hours. Now she's a normal normal little girl again. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing, man. Well, Justin, I mean, you're just, you're an angel, dude. I mean, you're doing some incredible work. And I've been on the verge of tears, basically, this whole conversation. And I really appreciate everything you're doing. I think it's amazing. Um, is there anything before we wrap up, anything you want to mention, make sure people know about, where they can follow you, all of that? Yeah, if you if you feel led to do anything with Raiden, go check out the hashtag Stand With Raiden. So it's called Stand With Raiden. Um, and I bet he would love, uh, I text him videos back and forth, his parents' videos every day, him and I. And I've, I've taken him to the hyperbarics 20 times myself. I've had family dinners at his house. His, his grandma can cook some meatloaf. Absolutely, she can cook some meatloaf. Um, and, uh, hyperbaric chambers is some really illustrative. It's, all, it's yeah. been done like 30 years. been doing it for over 30, but it's just it's really something special. I had one really when is. I played, yeah. He's, he's, um, he's getting better sleep than he's ever gotten. He's not up and down in the night anymore. Uh, he's able to focus more at school, and he feels more positive. He's having less and less of those suicidal thoughts. Amazing. Um, so it's hashtag stand with Raiden. And then, uh, if people want to support fight for the forgotten, probably the easiest and newest way to do that is becoming part of our fight club. And so kind of like fight club, the movie, the first rule is you don't speak about fight club or second rule is you don't speak about fight club. Our first rule is that you do speak <laughs> about fight club. Let people know that you're part of our monthly giving club. You can give up a, a latte every month or a Starbucks drink and, um, send us $5 a month and that helps us know our, our budget for the year. Um, and, uh, the more monthly donors we get, we, we get to plan out how many wells we get to drill, how many kids here stateside we get to help, um, how much land we can buy throughout the year. Um, and so that's by becoming part of our fight club. You can get t-shirts there, all that. It's just fight for the forgotten.org. And then you just click on the fight club. Awesome. I think that's pretty cool. You're a hell of a man. Yeah. Well, thank you, my man, brother. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. I'm so grateful for you guys. This is awesome. Uh, this is kind of a, a dream come true for me, meeting you guys. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank man. you, brother. Dream come true to have you in here. Yeah. No. Fucking A. <laughs> we like having guys like you that make a difference in the world. Uh, yeah. You know, on our show. Yeah. Thank you. It's so important right now. Mm. You know, I think there's a big, there's a lot of disillusionment with being a human hmm. right now, you know? And we're in a crisis of needing connection. Well, love. you know, a lot of people don't understand um, why they don't make themselves think, why am I not happy? Hmm. Yeah. Why, why don't I make me happy? No, why? Yeah. And I used to say that too. And then you know what I did? I helped somebody. And then I got addicted to helping people. Right. People thinking I was special, I was nice, and they giving me a good reputation because I was helping them. People said, well, Mike is a good man. If you ever had some money, Mike, if you had, you needed Mike again. And then that, that um, I got addicted to that. Yeah. Only by saying, I'm a good motherfucker. Oh, he's a hell of a motherfucker. He's beautiful. He's, and that's addicting, helping yeah. people for stuff like that. And that's addicting, too. Yeah, definitely. You know? Absolutely. 
you feel that rush. You never know. You think connection. you know, you just don't know what's wrong. Fuck, and then you fucking clean somebody's yard out and you fucking get a rush. I'm yeah. gonna do another one. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to that saying, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. But loved people love people. Yeah. Mm. Or even maybe helped people in turn help people. So once you are helped, you can help someone else. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it is about that connection, community, yeah. relationship. Yeah. Because we can have all the stuff in the world, but if yeah. we don't have people, yeah. it doesn't have to be a ton of people, but it has to be meaningful people in our lives. Absolutely. You won't have much meaning without those meaningful relationships. Mm. It's awesome. It's great stuff, man. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Mike? Great show. Amazing. Great spiritual show. This is this is what we do when the things that I call um, mind stuff, you know. It's yeah. good stuff. Yeah. It's awesome. Thank you. Well, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to head to fightfortheforgotten.org. You can also stand with Raiden through following Justin the Big Pygmy on social media. Hot boxing love Raiden. Hot Boxing stands with Raiden, without a doubt. I love that. Um, head to our website, hotboxingpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm Evan Britton. I'm Mike Tyson. And we're out of here, brother. Bye. Peace. Oh, this is beautiful, man. Hey, thank you. <laughs>